welcome. I'm the Retro Repair Guy. So today I want to bring you something a little different. I want to take an up close and personal look at a childhood hero of mine, the General Lee that's right behind me that was on the show Dukes of Hazards that ran from 1979 to 1995. So let's go take a look inside. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. They make great quality PCBs from your Gerber files starting at only $5. All standard PCBs have now been upgraded for free from TG13140 heat resistance to TG150. If you're in need of getting your own PCBs manufactured at reasonable prices for production runs or simply a one-off PCB, they offer excellent quality and unsurpassed service to help you with your designs and free online quotes. And with their quick order feature, your parameters are automatically set from your Gerber files. With fast turnaround times and fast delivery, I definitely recommend checking them out. The link is in the description below. The Dukes of Hazard was a popular TV show at one point ranking second to Dallas that aired on CBS from 1979 to 1985. It was about two unlikely heroes from Hazard County, Georgia, on probation for moonshine running, who while always evading the corrupt commissioner Boss Hogg and his deputies with wild car chases, end up foiling the nefarious plans of Boss Hogg, and in the process, sometimes even end up helping Boss Hogg by defeating bad guys after revenge against them. Two good old boys making their way the only way they know how. There's no denying that without John Schneider and Tom Wopat, there was no show, and while season 5 made some people feel like Coin Vance were imposters, the one thing that kept the Duke boys going strong even throughout the movies was the General Lee. For myself and many others still today, it's a car we dreamed of owning alongside many others made famous by 80s movies. I mean sure, the car couldn't talk, it wasn't bulletproof and couldn't drive itself, but you knew once the Dukes got inside, they would be safe and be able to outrun anyone and perform some of the most amazing jumps that no other car survived. It was the General that was the real star of the show, that pulled everyone together and became an iconic part of the 1980s. I was recently called to repair an electrical problem and take a look at a possible CB installation on an old car. To my surprise, the car was not just any old car, but one of my childhood's dream car, the General Lee. It's not often that we get to sit in a car replica of a TV show of our youth, and I had never seen one up close, so I decided to take out my camera and take a closer look inside and out, and share my experience with you. One of the questions I had growing up was why it was called the General Lee. Well, the car's name is a reference to an actual person named Robert E. Lee, who was a general of the Confederate States Army during the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865. It's also the reason why the car bears a Confederate flag on its roof. The original General Lee was a 1969 Dodge Charger, but throughout the years the production team used between 255 to 325 cars, a disputed number and closer to 275 to 280 removing miniatures used at one point, according to John Schneider, who played Bo Duke. Because of this, they used both 68 and 69 chargers as the main difference between them were the grille and the taillights with a few minor changes on the interior, so it was very easy to replace these when and if needed. In fact, after the first three General Lees started to show visible damage, the crew had to start making more. So the first General Lee built in Georgia was a 1968 Charger converted to look like a 1969. The taillight panel, front grille, and front seats taken from the first General Lee. The orange paint on the car is not stock. The 1969 Charger was offered in 18 different colors including bright red, but orange was not one of them. It was also originally sold with a vinyl cover on the rooftop that of course had been removed to allow the flag and name of the car to be painted on top. I was curious as to why the 1 of the 01 on the driver's side door seemed a little off. Turns out, this was intentional to replicate the same flaw that can be seen in Season 1, Episode 1 and in the clip of the jump used for the introduction. The wheels were generally 14 by 7 inch American racing brand vectors throughout the show with Carroll Shelby center caps and were mainly mounted on P235 70R14 BF Goodrich radial TA tires with the black wall side facing out. The engines inside the General Lees on the show varied, but they only used 318, 383 and 440 cubic inch engines. This replica sports a 383 engine. The engine has not been modified but has Eidelbrock chrome valve covers. And there's nothing like the sound of that revving engine. Now while we're in the engine, one of the things that makes the General Lee so recognizable is his Dixie horn which plays the first 12 notes of the song Dixie. This special horn runs on air with a tiny compressor and five trumpets each individually hooked up to the little compressor. The engine needs to be turning in order to provide enough power to the pump. Well, I never got to look inside the trunk of a General Lee, but it's no surprise to find Uncle Jesse's moonshine. 
This car has been signed by almost the entire cast of the Dukes, however, the signed parts were removed for safekeeping when not in the show. But we can see here the signature of James Best, who played Roscoe Coltrane. The only right you got is the rights I'm gonna read you. You can also see the large fuel pipe, which is also original to the car and it would not be complete without the cool looking flip top gas lid. Moving on to the interior of the car, the first thing you see when opening the door are the beautiful chrome sill plates. The door is made of a simple vinyl covering, reminiscent of a typical 70s car interior. The seats are the original seats offered in the 69 Charger with a beige interior. Roll bars were added to the General, and while they are a necessity of this car were to perform stunts, they are so thick given that they even have a foam wrapping that it prevents the driver's seat from going fully back, making it difficult for big and tall people like myself to enter and exit the car without emitting a few sounds. <laughs> All right. Adding to this, the fact that this car kept the original steering wheel that is so large it rubs up against my legs. The instrument panel just rocks. It's padded and includes that old school clock that cars used to have and has separate gauges for the RPMs, the speed, fuel, temperature, oil pressure and alternator, making it feel like a real race car. The temperature controls are mounted on the top as opposed to the usual dashboard. In this reproduction, the radio has been removed and while this particular dashboard was kept in the car's original black, the original General had a beige interior. Whenever the production team got a hold of one with a black interior, it was normally painted beige to match the original car with its beige dashboard, door panels, and seat. And of course, the faux wood grain center console with an automatic transmission lever for a very sporty look and feel. By the way, I'm sure many of you know this, but all the General Lees were automatic transmissions as confirmed by John Schneider. In fact, looking at the brochure, it was only offered as an automatic with either a column mounted selector or console mounted selector. There's no denying that the Dukes and the General were a big part of growing up in the 80s, and while I would love to own one alongside many of the others made famous by Hollywood during that era, I'm happy that I got to spend an afternoon alone with the General and got to know him a little better. As creepy as that may have sounded, it's one more off the bucket list along my picture with William Shatner and the Hulk. Thanks for watching. All right, everybody, that wraps it up. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll be back with another restoration soon. But for now, I'm going to have some fun.